Hello, everyone. Uh, although we still have a few people uh, left to arrive, I think we're going to get started uh, so that we have plenty of time to hear from the panel and ask them questions at the end. Um, I'm Audrey Andela. I'm the chair of WIT, Women in Telecoms and Technology. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we've been around for 20 plus years, um, providing networking events for primarily women in tech, but also men are always welcome. Um, our main focus is these types of events where we try to educate about an industry topic, provide a networking, networking, networking opportunities, see if I can speak, uh, and also elevate the voices of women in the sector who have something to say on a particular technology subject. Uh, so that's us. Um, tonight we have a fantastic panel and we are so grateful to the Catapult for hosting us. And uh, there are a few other WIT directors in the room. Uh, Helen Kaliski, uh, actually Michelle Senecal is out still passing out badges, and Annette Nabavi at the back run <laughs> running the Q&A on Zoom. Um, so that's all the time I'm going to take so that there's plenty of time for the panel. So I would like to invite to the stage Sue McGuire, Business Engagement Manager for the Digital Catapult in Northern Ireland. Whoa. Thanks, Audrey. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Catapult. Geraldina Irahata, the Digital Catapult Chief Commercial Officer, sends her apologies. She was set to speak this evening, but has been able, unable to attend, so um, she's put me instead. Uh, my name is Sue McGuire. I'm the Business Engagement Manager for Digital Catapult in Northern Ireland, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all this evening to Digital Catapult. As I started to draft my notes for this five minute presentation, sure. I realized that I've actually worked in the technology sector for over 35 years. I know I don't look that old, okay, but we part that one, we're carrying on. I started my career way back with WordPerfect. Oh, <laughs> Shift F7, Alt F3. That was before the internet as we know it. That was before the World Wide Web as we know it. And that was definitely before the smartphones as we know them now. And I think that's quite scary for lots of reasons. But rather than dwell on that dark and distant past, I'm going to look to the future and I'm going to provide a very short overview of Digital Catapult, okay? Normally this presentation takes me 45 minutes, okay? I've got five, so come with me on a very, very quick journey through Digital Catapult. But before I do, I'm gonna ask you, how many have been to the Digital Catapult offices before or know about Digital Catapult? That's the hardest question you're getting. Okay, well, thank you very much. For those of you who know about Digital Catapult, this is going to be a refresher. And for those of you who are new to Digital Catapult, as I say, it's going to be a very, very quick snapshot of some of our activities. I'm looking at my slide deck. There we go. Digital Catapult is the UK authority on advanced digital technology. Our mission is to accelerate industry adoption of advanced technologies, driving growth in the UK economy. We create new opportunities through collaboration and innovation, and we do this in three ways. We deliver specialized acceleration and innovation programs that are aligned to industry challenges and themes. We build test bed facilities, run pilots, proof of concepts, and test new business models. We have facilitated R&D projects, inform policy recommendations, and lead research on emerging tech trends. Digital Catapult has a huge range of stakeholders. Um, we work with government and public sector, startups and scale-ups, corporates and industry, investors, academia, and then that wider Catapult network. Digital Catapult works across five core technology groups. Future networks including IoT and 5G. Immersive technologies including AR and VR. Artificial intelligence machine learning distributed systems, including distributed ledger technologies, and most recently, quantum. And these technologies based are the foundations that we use to focus on three core application areas. To provide an open and interoperable digital infrastructure, to build a digital and resilient supply chains, 
And finally, the, vir the virtualization without wine and cyber physical aspect, all of which are underpinned by the overarching goal of building sustainability into business process and delivery. Now, Digital Catapult has lots and lots of programs and activities and projects across all of our technology groups and application areas. As I say, 45 minutes, but since I've only got five minutes, I wanted to focus on one particular project program, and that's the Sonic Labs program. Digital Catapult is partnering with DSIT in a 30 million pound project funded over five years. And the aim of the programme is to address the challenge for UK companies to engage with 5G technologies. As you may know, the market is dominated by key players, Samsung, Nokia, Ericsson. But the Sonic Labs programme is providing a commercially neutral collaborative environment for testing interoperability and integration. And the aim is to build a UK ecosystem that will support small and large vendors to commercialize advanced wireless technologies and solutions. And a core strand of this program is the design and delivery of targeted innovation and acceleration programs. So far, Sonic Labs program has onboarded 22 vendors and more than 50 open RAN and infrastructure products have been tested in the lab. By going through the Sonic Labs program, vendors have the opportunity to integrate their products and test the interoperability with other open RAN components with the hope of accelerating their market readiness. They also benefit from the opportunity to share learnings and best practice, connect with potential clients and also with industry leaders. Now, if anybody wants to know more about Sonic Labs, there is a tour this evening on the newly newly opened, newly launched Sonic Labs here in the Digital Catapult offices. So I would suggest if it's an area of interest, you sign up for that. And as I say, I've only got five minutes. So if you'd like to know any more about Digital Catapult, our activities and some more about our programmes, then I'm around all evening. So please do come and say hello. Thank you very much. And over to Linda, my colleague, who will be chairing the uh, panel this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sue, and a big welcome from me. Uh, nice to see you all here in this beautiful sunny day, and a big welcome to our audience online. So today I'm going to chair an amazing panel, and we're here to talk about uh, MWC. I don't know actually if any of you has been there. I hope I'm gonna ask for a, a raise of hands who has been to the, okay, I can see a couple, okay, great. So today you'll have the opportunity to, to hear more about what has happened there, we try to, um, bring a discussion around some of the trends, latest technologies, and where we're going, you know, what we're going to explore in the future, uh, what is happening, you know, also in terms of like diversity, how can we encourage more women in this sector. So without further ado, uh, I would like to um, tell you who is the amazing panel tonight. Uh, we've got Anki Tan, we partner global co-head of communication at CMS International Law Firm. Dr. Mai Short, CBE and Chief Architect at Satellite Applications Catapult and former Chief Scientific Advisor at the Department of Business and Trade. There were many more um, titles here, but we had to shorten it because Mike's career is very long. And also we have tonight Kim Villiun, uh, who is the Market Engagement Director at GSMA. So we'd like to invite uh, my wonderful speakers to join me on stage now. Okay, so um, first of all, I mean, I, I was reading the news the other day and um, just realized that this week is the 50th anniversary of the first cellular handheld phone, 50 years. And I think we've come a long way. And I think this year, um, NWC have definitely showed us that it's not just anymore about mobile, but it's about connectivity. And, and tonight, yes, I would like to really get a feel of what has happened there. Uh, but before we do that, Obviously, I want to introduce a bit more my, uh, my wonderful uh, panel here. So I would like to tell us a little bit more about what, who you are and, uh, you know, what is your connection to telecom? Maybe starting with um, Anne. Okay. 
testing if the microphone is working. <laughs> okay. Um, first, thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor to be with the other panelists here and to speak about Mobile World Congress. My name is Anne Kitan. I'm a partner and global co head of telecoms at CMS. By way of context, um, we're an international law firm. We are set in 43 countries, got more than 1,200 partners, more than 5,000 uh, lawyers across the world. Uh, in the telecom sector, we've got uh, more than 450 lawyers working. And I want to stress that by that, I mean sector focused lawyers. So it's not just commercial lawyers, you're going to have corporate lawyer, banking lawyer, tax lawyer, employment lawyer who exclusively or almost exclusively work in the sector and know the sector extremely well. So going back to myself, um, my trade is uh, I'm a banking lawyer um, and I work mainly in financing transaction in the tech media telecom sector and particularly telecom sector. Um, I was going to say recently, but it's been for the last 10 years, so that doesn't count as recent anymore. Um, I work with a lot of my colleagues uh, on really large uh, transactions, um, many on digital infrastructures, working on fiber, towers, um, data centers, subsea, these kind of um, products. We are extremely interested in how the sector is evolving and how the network are changing and adapting. And I think we're going to speak about that and what we've seen at Mobile World Congress. Um, every year we go to Mobile World Congress. This year we were about 10 of us, including me. That was my first Mobile World Congress. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to okay. speaking about that. Thank you. Mike, tell us about your uh, maybe long career <laughs> in uh, one minute. <laughs> well, I wasn't there when the first mobile phone call was made back in 1973, but I have been involved since 1987. Um, in terms of Mobile World Congress, I was there partly as uh, outgoing chief scientific advisor for the Department of Business and Trade, and we had some 120 UK-based companies at Mobile World Congress. I'll give you a flavor of that. Now I'm working a little bit in a portfolio approach. I tend to say I'm mic short, unplugged, unplugged from government, unplugged from full-time work. I have a portfolio approach. I'll explain it a bit more later. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, my name is Kim Fullion. I am a market engagement director uh, for the digital inclusion program, which is in a, a department called Mobile for Development within GSMA, so the department that most people don't always know about. Um, but obviously here tonight to give you a bit of the insider perspective. Um, and obviously if you have any feedback, send it elsewhere. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, but yeah, the, the sort of key areas where I've been engaging over the last few years have been around digital inclusion. So I'm really a techie at heart. I'm excited about all the advancements in, in technology, but also deeply passionate about ensuring um, we address the digital divide. Um, and so I'll share that sort of flavor of MWC as well. Um, and I'll leave some of the other more uh, exciting boundary pushing <laughs> innovations to my colleagues here. Thank you, Kim. And just a reminder that we're going to have at the end a Q&A session. So have a think about some questions you might ask, want to ask our, our panelists and also from our audience online. Of course, there is a Q&A uh, box that you can, uh, where you can put your, your questions in. Um, so I kind of like to start always with a bit of uh, numbers, mostly because this was also my first time at the Mobile Congress and, uh, and we had to keep track of the steps because for those who have not been, it's an amazing, massive conference. I counted myself over 81,000 steps in those four days. Um, and my team, we had a total of over 1 million steps. So we did walk a lot, but even that, I must say, I regret to have uh, booked too many meetings because I would have loved to actually even walk around a bit more and see all the amazing tech that was there. But anyway, so starting with some figures, maybe Kim, you could give us a bit of a feel of what, who, you know, how many people were there, what did you actually, yeah, the scale of the event? Sure. So yeah, just uh, building on the on the steps, those steps were um, taken by around 88,500 people this year. So 88,500 attendees at the event this year. Just to put it into perspective, so I'll share a bit tonight on like pre-pandemic numbers, post-pandemic, because some of you might know, uh, we were one of the first major conferences to actually um, cancel our event in the wake of COVID. And so obviously it's been a gradual building up to pre-pandemic numbers. So that's 88,500 this year. Our, at our peak in 20, uh, uh, 2019, it was 
um, 109,000 attendees. So we've come like uh, leaps and bounds the last two years just to get back to that number. Uh, and I think uh, really one of the key highlights for me, and it will come up in our discussion tonight, is that 56% of those are from adjacent industries. So yes, mobile and telecoms, but actually like the big, big uh, inclusion of adjacent industries in not only the event, but everything we do at the GSMA uh, was certainly represented by um, the attendee numbers. Uh, and then those are from 202 countries and territories. Um, and uh, also this year, I think what, we, what we're seeing more of now is much more senior uh, participation. So uh, over half of the attendees were around director level and up, of which 21% were around C-suite. So just a really, really high senior um, level participation at the event. And it might come up a bit later when we touch on a few other topics again. Uh, over 2,400 exhibitors across those eight massive halls. So all those steps, it's really a huge venue. If you haven't been there, I can't help you picture it. It's, it's massive. Um, over 1,000 speakers and thought leaders. Um, and then again, the representation of around 40% of those speakers from adjacent industries. So just to show how it's evolving um, uh, as an event. Uh, and then just some other key stats around reporting. So over 2,400 journalists and industry analysts, analysts from around the world, um, around 10,000 networking meetings set up through the MWC app. Oh, I was enjoying the spotlight. <laughs> um, and then um, addition, in addition to the in-person activities, and obviously everyone who was able to be there, there's also the online participation. So around um, 100 a million unique viewers um, of keynote sessions uh, across various platforms, and that number keeps growing. That's all available for even you guys to view if you'd like to. I'm going to reserve some of the uh, more juicy, interesting stats for a later discussion. But yeah, I just think um, numbers aside, the GSMA view and also the view of many of our partners who have attended, you know, from the CAMS days and even, you know, earlier NWC Barcelona events, uh, this was the best one. Um, it's, it's probably difficult to always explain why, but things worked well. You know, the engagement levels are high. Um, I think coming back from COVID, there was this idea that we wouldn't need large scale in-person events. And this year, I think certainly demonstrated that NWC is the meeting place for our industry. And it's where, you know, all of those exciting conversations that advance um, or, you know, the industry as a whole start to happen and, and get um, catalyzed, so yeah. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Let's hear from Mike. You've been attending for quite a few years. How did you how did you find it this year? What was different? You know, what would you say, really? Well, I was uh, I've been going for over thirty years, so uh, I think by comparison, it was the best. Uh, I think we could see that Barcelona was back because there were lots of characteristics. It wasn't just the volume of activity or the footfall; it was also the value. I think that could be seen there. Lots of people hadn't seen each other for a long time. Uh, some of the variety uh, added a lot to the value itself. So it was much more than a mobile World Congress. I think it's a digital World Congress. Um, but I think we could also see in some of the numbers some trends, which I'd just like to mention briefly. Um, if we look at AI, for example, over 10% of all the stands identified as being AI ready or AI capable. And when you think of 10% of 2,400, that's a lot of companies that were not talking about AI a year or so ago. Uh, I would also quite surprised by the number of uh, companies that self-identified as satellite, not just mobile or Wi-Fi, but satellite. And the numbers there were 57 on the exhibition list. That's a good 45 more than last year or in previous years. So you can start to see some trends in the AI space and the satellite space. But I think people were there to buy and sell. You know, investment was taking place in the corridors. People weren't just there with checkbooks. They had their credit cards. They had their order books and so on. You know, people were transacting. So to me... That's why I think it's one of the best ever. The weather wasn't brilliant, but you can't ask We'll, we'll work on that, don't worry. I know, yeah, it wasn't the typical Spanish weather you would expect, but we did enjoy it. And Anne, it was the first time for you, like me. Uh, how did you find it? What was your impression of the event? Yeah, it was, it was the first time. So as you said, the weather wasn't uh, super, it snowed. <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that I'm coming to Barcelona, um, but uh, I, I was there for work, obviously, so I had loads of meetings. I did a lot of walking around, a lot of getting lost. Um, but uh, overall, I think for me, it kind of delivered of what you imagine is Mobile World Congress. So it's big, it's bright, it's bold. 
it's massive. I mean, the, it dwarfs the Excel Center. So it takes about half an hour to go from one end to the other, if you don't get lost along the way, like me. Um, it's bright. Every single stand tries to outshine the other. You have the impression of being on Oxford Street at Christmas. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. It's bold. There is robots galore. Yes, you go to Mobile World Congress to see the robots. Um, loads of gadgets. Um, I was quite surprised to see there are millions of ways of torturing a mobile phone. I think my favorite one was um, a Japanese chef who made a salad on a mobile phone. I'd be glad to know that no mobile phone was harmed in that process. <laughs> and it was an interesting thought for me to think that I don't need a chopping board anymore. All I need is a super strong mobile phone. So yes, so that was my impression. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a bit about uh, cool gadgets because we, we, we did see quite a few. Uh, but before we do that, maybe, uh, so there were different themes that were covered by the event, 5G acceleration, reality, open net, fintech, digital everything. So I just want to hear from you, what did you see as the key highlight from the show? What is really, you found really different or that is inspired you? Maybe who wants to start, Mike? Um, I, I think it was very evident people were looking at private networks on the basis that it's capable and possible now. So how do you blend, for example, cloud infrastructure with private network infrastructure for enterprise environments? So that could be tailored for a factory, whether you're in manufacturing or some other process of, uh, of making things. But also it could be tailored towards a hospital or it could be tailored towards an entertainment venue. There was much more talk about how can you do virtualized solutions on a public network. And I think that plays to some of the security strengths of 5G, some of the new strengths coming in with 5G advanced, but it also plays to the fact that people are looking for new markets where mobile can really make a difference. Thank you, Mike. Kim, what did stand out for you? Um, I think I'll share some of the perspectives that uh, maybe Mike um, and Anne weren't. So again, I think one of the key features um, for us and the work that we care about and, and are quite active on is around digital inclusion. So in Matt's keynote, he mentioned um, that the usage gap needs to be a key priority for the industry. So for those who aren't aware, that's 3.2 billion people globally who live within the uh, footprint of a broadband network that are not currently using and benefiting from mobile internet. So whilst we're at a conference where you're seeing all these incredibly exciting advancements in tech. We're thinking about the most basic benefits of mobile internet that are not currently um, being leveraged by 3.2 billion people uh, worldwide. And I think Doreen Bogdan, Bogdan Martin built on that. So Secretary General of the ITU uh, participated in keynote two where um, she was sharing three different scenarios of us delivering on the SDGs. And um, I don't wanna be the spoiler alert there. <laughs> there was a positive spectrum and a, and, a, and a negative end of the spectrum there and um, her different views on like what our industry needs to prioritize and actually you can go and view that so I won't share more but it's all available online to you so I think I, I really enjoyed that those topics were being prioritized at an event where we're hearing whispers of 6G you know and you're like okay great but what about the 3.2 billion so that's that's really essential and that got carried through to um the ministerial program, which many people don't know about at MWC. So it's a conference within a conference. It's where we invite all the sort of government um, sector stakeholders and, and um, multilateral organizations to come and debate the slightly less, um, less sexy topics, but the more important topics that need to be discussed and debated about. And so, yeah, so I think that was definitely a key theme um, for a ministerial program as well. Um, and then four years from now, we work with startups who are addressing the digital divide. So uh, they were there, they were at four years from now, but the the four years from now program was always separate to MWC this year and previous years it's now been um, bought in under the same roof. Um, and the, uh, yeah, the multiplied effect of that is just huge. The, uh, it kind of feels like you're walking into a beehive. <laughs> you walk in there, it's just like a buzz. It didn't matter what day of the conference you were going or what time of the day. Um, and yeah, just, uh, Four years from now is basically the startups that you expect to see exciting things from. So it's a bit of a window into the future. So it's always exciting to go and have a wander, a mindless wander around. And I'm sure we'll touch on it again later. But yeah, I'll pause at that then. Thank you. And you could actually feel that you were going to the entrepreneurs uh, area because there was bumping music, you know, 
really and it, all of a sudden it ruins in baggy like, baggy jeans and like all yes, sorts of yes, different yes. So, yeah, yeah really quite exciting different feel. And Anne, how was it for you? Any key teams that stood um, out? Well, I, I have to continue on the foyer for, for nothing because obviously you, when you go to Mobile World Congress, um, you want to see, you know, what, what the new gadget, what Samsung's got out and all this. But uh, uh, you see the whole ecosystem uh, to eco use it. It's, you, you, you see not just the big names who are showcasing the, the, the new thing, but you're also seeing applications, VR, um, in, there was countless amount, you could run a marathon, you could row, you could play as a team, you could do, I mean, incredible things. Um, uh, four years from now, for me, was where that fits into that ecosystem is what you described. It's a window in, in the future. It's an industry that's incredibly dynamic. Um, and I think it's very good to see not just all these big companies, but also all the startup that comes up and have new ideas and are visionary. And I don't know how many of them will still be there <laughs> in four years, but um, it's it's quite uh, interesting and refreshing. So that was my one of my favorite things there. Certainly, thank you. Um, and going deeper into some of the topics, I mean, the Digital Catapult, obviously we were there with the team uh, representing Sony Labs and of course, we did see um, that there was a clear theme around openness in mobile networks and how they are promising to make uh, networks more agile and future proof. Did you see what, did you attend any, any kind of um, talks? What were your impressions about this topic? Did you meet any particular vendor or open run products? Do I go? Go, Mike. <laughs> I, th I think uh, the theme of open networks has some drivers to it that we should be quite clear about. So cost reduction is important in this industry because if the demand is nearly saturated in some markets, unless you reduce cost, actually you're going to struggle to survive. So I think open networks have a strong cost reduction driver. I also think they have a new ways of delivering business type driver. And I also think they're pulling through some ideas from the research community. So there are several reasons why the open networks are important. I think one additional area that uh, came across is open APIs, application programming interfaces, because if we're to diversify the range of services, we need open networks that support open programming interfaces. So to me, I think I saw a lot more around that services development than I did just around the open networks themselves. What also impressed me though, was that quite a few were talking about energy efficiency in the process. They were talking about sustainable development goals in the process. They weren't looking at networks in isolation from SDGs or programming interfaces and services. They were looking at the motive for the customers to adopt these sort of technologies. Thank you, Mike. Would you like to comment on this, Kim? Uh, no, I just think uh, the um, so the open API thing is an initiative that was actually launched recently um, to also sort of help the mobile industry really um, evolve, right? So we know we need to uh, be more open, more participatory, uh, participatory, allowing others to to build without restraints on, on the network. So mm -hmm. I think uh, there's around 30 mobile operators now who've signed up to that initiative. So I think it's a good start. Um, and yeah, definitely we'll hopefully see some more exciting um, impact from some of the projects launching. Of course, I mean, I'm wondering what would be the challenges, especially for Anne coming from the low uh, world, what would that mean? I mean, are you seeing any particular changes? Um, well, for, from from our perspective, obviously, we've um, at CMS we've, we've followed 5G for a while. We have uh, an expert guy who just relaunched the um, the um, new edition. I think we've, we're covering 50 countries and looking at regulatory angles um, of all these new technology, but also what is actually happening in each country in terms of number of networks, number of use case. And obviously when you go to Mobile World Congress, one of the things that I was looking forward to was to see all these applications. Um, I was here in 2019 where, where you're sitting and um, I was uh, listening avidly to what um, speakers were saying about their time at Mobile World Congress. And at the time, one of the questions was, what cool use case have you seen for 5G? Um, and what's really interesting is to see where you are five, five, four years from then, but I live there. Um, so uh, it was um, quite interesting to see the progress and to see you know, what you describe in terms of um, the application and you know, uh, networks being put in place. I, I quite like 
um, uh, to see uh, the industry applications. Um, there was a very interesting showcase um, at one of the Chinese uh, operators showing what they've done in a mine uh, with automation uh, and therefore preventing humans from going into very hostile environment effectively. So that's the sort of thing that you expect to see in terms of the future and, and application for 5G. That, that's the door that will be open to 5G. So that's um, was the thing that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Can I just add an example of something we announced at Mobile World Congress? This was announced between Nokia and the European Space Agency. And Nokia have provided some kit into the European Space Agency in Harwell to look at the metaverse from an industrial viewpoint. How can these satellites connect with reliable long distance connectivity to remote locations such as mines where you may have lone workers who need to be kept safe, where you may need to train people remotely as to how to use dangerous machinery, where you may wish to use AR and VR, hence the metaverse, remotely for that particular location. They also are going to look at other private network solutions for other locations as well as mines but that could be hospitals, that could be retail outlets, that could be factories. But actually that combination of the metaverse, mines and remote locations with satellite was an interesting uh, option that I saw. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that there was also, you mentioned about energy efficiency later on. I particularly saw also focus on sustainability. I mean, I wasn't there in previous years, but did you, was there anything that you felt there was a key kind of, again, a key, um, talk or anything particular that kind of came to life for you in the event during the event? I think um, Kim's mentioned it briefly earlier on. Some of the attendees were from the energy sector who are looking to find ways of supporting the telecoms industry, but also using the telecoms industry to become more efficient. When you move into a mixed fuel environment, such as solar and wind, as well as electricity, <laughs> gas and nuclear, you need to think about the control of those um, energy sources. Clearly, uh, some operators are already experimenting with solar power at their base stations or sites. And that sort of convergence between energy and telecoms, I think, was much more vivid and visible this year. I'd also stress, as per my point earlier on, energy efficiency is vital because energy costs are becoming a high element of energy of the OPEX, the operational cost of a network. So there has to be more attention on it. And it was a real step up on previous years. By contrast, I think the UN Sustainable Development Goals, I think, have been reported on very well for at least eight years by GSM Association. And I think continuing down that stream has been really good. But energy itself has not had the same high profile. I think maybe I'll add. So I think this year, yeah, we certainly saw a lot more of it being visible and um, a lot of the exhibitors showcasing their initiatives on that front. I think that it's partially for several like different reasons. One of them being that the GSMA is uh, sort of leading the industry towards becoming net zero by 2050. And obviously we have, um, you know, strong efforts with, with mobile operators on that front. Um, but paired with, you know, pressure from uh, customers, shareholders, civil society and so forth. I think we're just seeing general migration towards that, that becoming a, a bigger priority for companies, not just for like a corporate, uh, you know, social good, but actually like, um, yeah, cost savings for smaller entities and, and just better positioning. Um, and I think obviously we know there's a benefit to positioning yourself as that for the, the PR and the public exposure that that can bring. Um, but yeah, also just recognition that we're living in a rapidly changing world and we're needing to become a little bit more uh, prepared and forward thinking resilient in our networks and, and how we can adapt to some of the, the climate uh, we're seeing so yeah Kim, then I know, yeah so uh, th th it's true there was a lot being said on sustainability um and th the industry itself uh, i think produced 3.5 percent of the global carbon emissions so we produce more than aviation um so there is a lot of efforts to do it was interesting to see that the energy companies were there um even if you look at something like data centers data center capacities by amount of power they consume. Um, so it's um, it's a problem for the industry. Um, I think there is a lot of talk about how um, technology and 5G technologies and standardization uh, around 5G technologies and uh, around open run could help to develop and encourage the development and deployment of energy uh, efficient technology 
and also energy efficient practices. And um, that's one of the things that a lot of people are working on and a lot of people are talking about. So yes, there's some progress to be done, but people are definitely looking at it. Thank you. More to do, of course, but uh, yes, yeah, sounded quite promising. And we did see quite a few gadgets there, some also covering that topic. And I think, I don't know if we can show the involved one slide where we try to capture some of the very cool tech that we saw at the show. There was one favorite for me uh, that I think you can see at the very bottom right of the screen. Uh, an AI-driven security robot that can scan up to 50 meters around, notify you if, it, if there is a danger such as a fire or, or glass breaking. It also has, well, it has five cameras. It can detect, uh, of course, a thermal camera, and it can also uh, sterilize germs and viruses and walls as it walks. So quite interesting there. I don't know if you can uh, uh, share with us what, were you, what was your favorite. I know that you shared, send us some of your pictures. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my favorite. It's the, the little potted plant uh, that you can see there on wheels. Um, so obviously it's Mobile World Congress, so it's more than a potted plant on wheels. Um, it's uh, filled with sensors um, and it's quite an intelligent plant. So um, if it needs light, it will move the source of light. It can tell its humans, you know, I need water or nutrients, which um, in my case would be quite vital because I've been known to kill a few house plants in my days. Um, I don't have any at the moment uh, for a good reason. Um, but uh, more importantly, the reason I liked uh, this little plant, which is called Herbie, um, is that uh, Herbie has legal personality. Um, Herbie is the CEO of the Plantiverse and he's got his own NFT, sort of, uh, you know, really great uh, uh, words there. Um, it has its own bank account. It has 2,000 euros I was told on his bank account and it can go on the internet and buy what it needs. Um, I was assured that it can hire a lawyer if it wants to, um, which was extremely reassuring to know. Um, but joke aside, the, the, this was part of four years from now, and the, the technology um, is uh, already being tried um, in the, the most analog of all industry, which is agriculture. And it's being tried in an orchard in France, and they, they produce apples for cider. And through the technology, they can know almost tree by tree how the orchard is doing. Um, so they can know, for example, if the orchard is attacked, uh, if one tree is attacked by pests, and instead of spraying the entire field with pesticides, they will go and treat that tree. So you can immediately see the benefit here. And similarly, if a tree likes water, but not the other tree, you're not going to irrigate the entire pest. So you, very clever use of resources. And the company is more ambitious than that. They want to um, use eventually the technology to protect um, the environment areas of the environment. So, for example, they want to protect forests, etc. I'm not sure how they're going to do that uh, and what environment and legal environment they're going to use to do that. But I thought that was extremely interesting. So, love Derby. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. What was your highlight? Well, I think you, your example is going to test the regulatory bounds, isn't it? You know, <laughs> which, which competition or market is it in? Um, but in, in terms of the two, I'm going to mention briefly. Uh, I was impressed by um, Aura Cast, A U R A Cast, Aura Cast, that's not shown up there. This is the ability to share music from Bluetooth via headphones. So maybe you and other members of your family or in a room and you want to listen to the same music, this is a means of sharing music through Bluetooth type capability into headsets. But they also have some noise cancelling uh, devices to protect your hearing so that nobody's getting too loud in any pair of headphones. So they've thought about the hearing loss and damage through volume. But the other one I want to mention is um, Bullet Mobile, that won best in show, and it's not on there either. Mm -hmm. um, so Bullet Mobile is a British company that has the brands such as Caterpillar for ruggedized mobile devices, but they also will have partnerships with Motorola DeFi uh, Design House. Um, and they produce some ruggedized devices, but the particular winning entry for best in show was bringing satellite and mobile together for emergency response. If you're out of coverage, you might want to use satellite coverage with this accessory called the Motorola DeFi accessory. Uh, you might want to be able to get emergency to you and from you to wherever you are without cellular coverage, but probably based on satellite coverage. That was a nice combination of direct to handset mobile and satellite. Thank you. Thank you, very handy gadgets. And Kim, did you have any favorites? 
I'll actually say that I was most disappointed in myself when you asked this question because I clearly did MWC wrong this year. I didn't have a load of time to uh, to geek out on the tech as was discussed, but um, I think I had a quick run around a new feature of MWC this year, which was the journey to the future. Um, so it had a few uh, really like cutting edge type of scenarios like hospital, the future, Hyperloop capsule. Uh, there's loads of information on, on that exhibit in particular online. Um, but I will share uh, one tech that again is close to my heart and uh, building on the topic of hearing loss. So uh, we had a startup uh, demo, um, demo there uh, their disability inclusion assistive tech. So it's on demand sign language interpretation for the deaf. Um, so this device, we've been enjoying the benefit of communicating over distance since it was first around, but the deaf obviously can't make use of calls in the same way. And so for the first time, they're able to do that through video conferencing via the app and get access to interpreters, which is obviously a constrained resource. They wouldn't typically have access to that. So they're able to talk to family, uh, neighbors and so forth without much effort, just at the sort of click of a button, something that we've been enjoying for so many years. So I think that was quite a, a cool thing. And then they also did the provision of sign language across the entire conference. So yeah, really exciting to see that being prioritized. Yeah, definitely. It was so much more. And as I said to my colleagues next year, if I go, I definitely want to allocate more time for walking around, small steps, of course, but definitely more innovation to spot. Um, I just want to kind of touch back on some stats as we move on to kind of the topic of female attendance, because I'm really interested to hear if that has increased compared to previous years. Maybe, Kim, this is a question for you. Yeah, sure. So uh, this year we saw... Um, 26% of the attendees were, were female. Um, and so that's up from 23% pre-pandemic level. So 2019, we had around 23% attendees. So 26% this year. So yeah, again, I see some frowns. I agree. We want to see that number going up and we can discuss a bit about like how we might see it and, and why we've seen some increases already now. But I do also want to just reflect on... Um, speakers so as the gsma one thing we can control is the representation of women in the speaker uh, lineup so we have kpis in this regard and we had around 40 percent of speakers at the conference this year being uh female and that's keynote speakers so really you know high profile um sessions with women being um on central stage uh so just to share a bit that's up from uh around 36 percent uh, in 2019. So we've seen some improvements there and that's the area that we can control. The other thing I would mention though is that some of the tracks are, um, or the themes are attracting more women. So we see higher uh, participation at the diversity for tech track. Um, we've also seen across the ministerial program, which I mentioned was government sector stakeholders and also um, multilateral organizations, much higher um, representation of female speakers in that particular sub-conference. Um, and so we are seeing, and then even in four years from now, if you walked in the hall, it was notable that like there were more women in there, which is quite exciting because if we're saying that's a window into the future, at least we know um, there is hope <laughs> to see that increase. Uh, but I think also something like uh, the addition of the adjacent industries is also driving up that number. So the fact that it's not just the telecoms and, uh, players involved in the conference, but more other industries coming alongside, hope to see that number evolve. Um, and then just in general, like the the fact that more companies have targets around, you know, employing women at more senior levels means that we are seeing increasingly more women participating as speakers and obviously attending these conferences um so yeah it's not the number i want to be reporting but we are aspirational in that regard and uh, hopefully there'll be improvements yeah and maybe i guess um i mean there's been a change maybe there are new jobs coming up i mean i myself i only started working telecom about three years ago so i'm fairly new but there are not just technology related jobs meaning you can bring different skills so maybe is it the fact that there are new jobs coming up where women understand there is a potential to under, to learn about technology or being that field but still bringing other skills as well that's a, maybe i don't know if you want to comment and 
Yes, so uh, obviously being a lawyer in telecom, mm -hmm. um, there's, other, there's uh, other things you can do. Um, but uh, no joke aside, I think uh, it's, um, it's quite striking that we still have way to go. Um, there's, there's progress. When I started uh, working in telecoms, I was probably the only woman in the room usually. Um, but uh, as you say, now there's uh, more and more. Um, and so what can we do? Um, I mean, I, I, from my perspective, we start as early as school, really. We need to attract young girls to do STEMs. Um, and that's, you know, you've got fantastic organizations like the STEMets who um, uh, you know, encourage girls to do STEM, but it's also shining the light on women who are in the industry and who are talent. We have incredible talent where women who have succeeded. And uh, we have organizations like WIT who do this, but at Mobile World Congress, there is also um, every year um, the Global Telecoms Women Network who do a big party. And there's a lot of um, women who speak and men and women come to this party because the women who speak there are CEOs. They're best in their fields. Um, they've got something incredible to say. Um, and they combine that with the launching of um, the Mobile Century, which is their annual, um, uh, their annual publication, which is written by scores of experts in the field, women experts in the field. Um, this year, the subject was digital metamorphosis, and we've spoken quite a lot about uh, a few of the subjects, whether it is uh, ESG, um, uh, more... Um, uh, diversity there is some things about people being deaf and 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 benefiting from from mobile phone etc technology etc but one thing that was shining the light uh on, on women that was really interesting at that event from my perspective was there were a lot of young ladies there uh, girls who were uh, at university first year freshers um and they were there as mentees and um you know, when you spoke to them, they they didn't really know what career they wanted to do. I mean, I didn't even know at that age what I wanted to do in my, the future, which is totally normal. But suddenly this is an option for them. And um, they look around and they see success, they see expertise, um, they see women who are driven and enjoy themselves in the field. And suddenly they're like, yeah, yeah this is interesting. And it's planting a little seed in there. So I think this kind of um, initiative um, shining the light on the successes and on women talent is really important. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, and I guess making sure that, you know, role, we always talk about role models and, and kind of showing what is, it, what is possible and, and excite people with the opportunities that are available in the world of tech. Uh, Mike, what do you think we can do more to get more women in technology and telecoms? Well, I, I've done quite a bit already, even though I'm male. I've, I've encouraged <laughs> females uh, all along the way. I, I deliberately took my successor as chief scientist, chief scientific advisor, Professor Julia Sutcliffe, uh, along so that she could see what Mobile World Congress was, but also understand it from how she will deliver the CSA role in business and trade. Uh, it's likely that she will take another 120 companies from the UK next year, and she'll, I'm sure, look for that blend of male and female. But I think she'll probably also give attention to inclusion more broadly, not just male, female, but also how can we be inclusive to those who are disabled in some ways, maybe the elderly, maybe some other areas need some attention on the inclusion front. Uh, it's already quite clear that um, some of the leading device vendors are beginning to think about different areas of inclusion that need attention. And I would include Apple and Samsung when I say that. Um, so actually, there are industry drivers to address these more broadly, not just from a talent point of view, but from a market point of view. On the talent front, I think it starts in schools. You know, we've got to encourage our families, our teachers who are in the schools. We've got to encourage people. You know, I do some teaching at certain universities. We need to encourage the pipeline to come through from an early age, and we all have responsibility to help that along. If I can maybe add, just I don't have the stats from this year, but we also on the on the fourth, the final day of NWC, usually open it up to schools uh, or school children to come and attend the event. It's called the YOMO, uh, Youth and Mobile. Uh, and usually the well, in 2019, the, it was an equal gender split. So we had 50 percent of the school children being um, being girls. So I think it's that type of you know large scale efforts that are going to hopefully generate that excitement for the tech space. And, you know, for them to see, I think. Again, I'll pivot back to the highlighting the adjacent industries like 
you might not start out in tech, you might start out somewhere, but somewhere else, but you know, technology is ultimately becoming part of every other industry. Um, and so an event like this will become more relevant for, for women in any sector at some point in time. So I do think we'll see, you know, at least in the next five years, I'm gonna be hopeful, a significant improvement on that, that number. Um, but then also like, yeah, those mentorship programs are so essential. I know in the four years from now program, they run uh, in partnership with UNDP, they have a mentorship program for female-led startups. And actually the call for mentors is open. If any of you are looking to inspire some young female founders, you're welcome to reach out to me for more information. But yeah, those types of things, um, really intentional like efforts to do that. Um, I'll then also just share, um, the work that we're driving in our program on bridging the mobile gender gap. So we release a report every year that evidences the, uh, essentially the, the gap in ownership and use of mobile internet in particular, ownership of devices and then use of mobile internet. Um, and so we, we sort of steadily saw a decline in the mobile gender gap uh, to 2020, where it was at its, uh, at its lowest, which is 15%. So women, being 15% less likely than men um, to use mobile internet. Um, but actually we've just reported um, and published some of the high level numbers and we're seeing that number going back up to almost pre-pandemic levels. So um, 2019, it was around 20% and it's now back up at 19%. And again, it's just highlighting that unless we're intentional and we have deliberate efforts to include women, um, you know, we're not going to see the equal advancement um, uh, in comparison to men. So we have seen uh, men's use of mobile internet sort of slow as well, but still not to the same degree um, uh, as women. So yeah, we need to be quite intentional in our efforts. Yeah. Absolutely. And we hope to come back here maybe next year with even better figures. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> before we go on to questions, uh, just some final thoughts. We talked about, we've seen, you know, it's been quite a successful event this year. So what would you like to see more of next year? What is really, you know, what are your hopes for? Something that you think we should continue. We talked about already some things, but any thoughts on this? Uh, for starters, more uh, seating space in <laughs> for those tired feet. Um, I will say this after a few years, you get really good at like planning where you're going to convene your meetings. So they're all sort of in the same hall. Um, but yeah, I think um, I, I personally, I love the mix of uh, there being this really excite, a lot of excitement around the new like boundary frontier tech type focus, but then also, um, you know, for other regions, there are other much more pressing challenges and those still being at the forefront of the discussions at MWC. Um, and then even in developed markets, this is becoming more of an issue. So the fact that it is uh, something that we we build into the, the program of MWC and uh, it is a priority that will be something we'll keep uh, for next year, certainly. Um, but I doubt there'll be much that we'll want to change. <laughs> like, I think this year was great. The balance was super across different themes. And um, yeah, I think next year we'll just obviously do a refresh, but hopefully just create that same uh, same vibe as this year. Mike, what would you like to see more of? Well, I, um, we did have a couple of ministers there, so maybe I just mentioned ministers briefly. Um, Lord Johnson was the investment, is the investment minister. It was his first Mobile World Congress, and he wants to spend a whole three, four days next year. You know, he, he was so impressed with the level of talent, energy, innovation, investment opportunities he couldn't believe it so uh, that that paid off so getting him back i think is a good idea we also had minister julia lopez minister for digital she is pregnant so she didn't do the ten thousand steps but she certainly met a lot of companies and was trying to introduce companies to others to help uh, the innovation story for the uk so i'd like more of the same more of that ministerial government and industry involvement i'd also like a strong demand-led focus because I think the industry itself needs to be clear on what it's focused on demand-wise. Sometimes the tech didn't necessarily meet the demand, but I think actually having a bit more demand-focused discussions would be a good idea. Okay, Mike, and um, some final thoughts? Um, yes, so I want to see more of four years from now. Um, I think that 
the ecosystem is incredible, but what makes it really vibrant and dynamic and innovative? And that's for me that that was four years from now. And um, it was a little bit far. <laughs> you had to walk quite a bit. I mean, thankfully there was like a, an over ground to to go to go there. But it's um, seeing more for that. I definitely go back as a tourist um, to go just geek out on the tech for four days. Um, and uh, I, I do hope that next year I'm going to see Herbie again. I'm, re I'm quite attached to Herbie. Um, I hope it will have grown and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see how it progresses. Thank you very much. Uh, and I definitely, yes, would like to see more, more of the four, four years from now and uh, meet more entrepreneurs. There were some quite exciting, uh, yeah, technology coming. Um, so we've got some time for questions. So if you do have any, please raise your hands and my colleague so here we at the front, thank you. Um, thank you very much. My name is Lopa Patel and I'm representing Diversity UK. I'm quite depressed by the statistics. The Congress has been going 30 years, 29% women, 3 billion people who are not included in this wonderful technology that we've got. So my question to you is, why do we accept that? And what would be a game changer for Mobile World Congress? Because actually at the moment, I wouldn't want to go. I would want to boycott it, quite frankly, because then, you know, what is going to change if it hasn't already changed so far? So what's going to be a game changer? Obviously we've heard of some positive things. I don't know if uh, Kim, you want to say about something else that maybe can help. Kim? Yeah, I st I'll start by just like a high level comment that the event reflects the industry. So unless the culture and focus and priorities of the organizations that come to the event and showcase at the event, unless that changes, you're not necessarily going to see a massive shift in focus at the event. Um, I think the GSMA, like we can do our best to make sure that the, the important topics as well as the really interesting, exciting ones are covered. Um, but I think what we're doing a lot of work on through our program is making sure that this agenda of di digital inclusion and addressing the usage gap and the gender gap uh, and the disability gap even is, is brought in and, and actioned by mobile operators and other digital players in the markets within which they operate. Um, and, you know, we've been working on the space for several years now. We're seeing great traction, but the important, the thing is you, you, you're going to need to see a lot more um, uh, sort of holistic action rather than piecewise efforts. Um, and so we've done a lot of work to firstly provide the data. So without the data, no one believes you. Uh, so we've got some of the data now to evidence that these gaps exist. Uh, we've also evidenced some of the key barriers around affordability, uh, digital skills. You know, there are some really clear things that our industry can address. Um, and then um, building the business case. So, you know, we say the gender gap, why is it important? Well, it's 50% of your population. And unless you're, you know, harnessing that potential, um, you're, you're missing out essentially. So, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Um, it's hard work and it will require a lot more people to care about this. We need some, some more Mike Shorts to be doing all the hard work of protecting women. But yeah, I think we need people really bought into that agenda. Thank you, Kim. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. No, I just, um, I agree that it's depressing um, in a sense. Um, and, and that it's not moving faster because we've been trying for, you know, um, I'm not going to weave in my age, but for a while. Um, and um, there is uh, two problems. The problem is 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 moving forward in the C suite and in the higher circles, and therefore being inspirations, and also having, as you said, the 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 the, the next generation coming in, and that starts, as you say, that starts with education, that starts with encouraging girls to come into that industry to do stems and to you know to come more massively because if you've got no one to choose or very little to choose um that comes out of university very little women to choose from you you're stuck with a with a problem so i think it's it's education and enabling women to move um further into the c-suite and being that that shining example thank you 
Is there any other question from the audience or online? One there, thank you. Hello, Helen Keegan. Um, I really enjoyed Mobile World Congress this year, and I thought 4YFM was great to be included in the whole thing. But I miss mobile advertising and marketing and media, which is kind of how I got into the industry 23 years ago. It was all muddled up in other areas. Was that deliberate? Did it work that better that way? Or are we missing a trick? There used to be something called App Planet, and that attracted a lot of the media and internet industries. Um, maybe in favor of four years from now, that's taken more of a back seat. Uh, however, I don't think the content industries have gone away at all. Uh, I think they were less visible on the exhibitor side, but they were certainly on the floor. Uh, if I take the 120 UK companies, quite a few of them, probably a good 30 or so, were in those areas you described, but they didn't all choose to have big flashy stands, they tended to be fairly small within four years from now. So I think if we think about the evolution of content in particular, I think there's more to be done there to actually bring it back a bit more, not necessarily through stands, but through profile, through subjects. If we think about the future of games, for example, or if we think about the future of music, or if we think about the future of, of maybe film and TV, I think there's a lot more to be done. There is no doubt that uh, streaming content is driving 5G investment right now. It, it's a key driver. So if streaming is the main delivery mechanism, it needs higher profile. Uh, so I, I take your observation on board, I think it's correct, but I don't think they wanted to necessarily have the big stands or the more traditional apps planet focus. On advertising, I think advertising has already moved to a different world. Um, and that's perhaps something for a longer debate rather than necessarily for the Mobile World Congress. Mike, one more final question, I think, from Mirza, running out of time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rima Peral Mutcher. I'm also a, a veteran of Mobile World Congress, maybe 19 years, not, not quite as many as Mike. Um, one thing that I observed, uh, particularly over, I think, the last two years, is that men uh, at the show are actually very active champions of the women participating at the event. So yes, the statistics are quite disappointing still, but what I notice is that there is a very active attempt, not just to be mentors, because we know that women are over mentored and under championed. And um, I think Mike has been an inspiration, but there are a lot of Mikes who are in the industry and really looking to make sure that women are being helped um, and seen as equal players. And I think that's gonna be true also in terms of driving all around inclusion. So that's a really encouraging kind of attitudinal shift that maybe is not captured um, in some of the statistics, which is very encouraging. I wanted to specifically ask about the announcement around the API initiative, because it was very curious. It was like the big announcement on day one um, and specifically, there was a mention of developers, and I'm I'm wondering how this also um, what this means for the app stores that have really benefited from the developers market, and where most of the focus has gone, not necessarily to the benefit of developers. And is this like a new monetization opportunity for mobile operators? and a way to open up the ecosystem. We know that Apple won't be able to necessarily charge the 30% that they have been. So I'm just wondering if you guys have any insight on that because I found it a really interesting development. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I actually don't have uh, all of the sort of technical know-how and how it's all going to be implemented. So it's still early stage. Um, like I said, we've got around 30 operators who've signed up to that. Um, I'll leave Mike to guess at how how that's all going to be. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, I do want to actually just uh, comment on, before you got to your question, I wanted to quickly comment on an observation. I uh, don't have data to back it up, but uh, we have seen sort of companies being a little bit more conservative with travel budgets. So attending events like MWC means that 
very carefully selected group of individuals get to go typically as we can see by the data more senior which again means that unless we're seeing women in those senior roles we are unlikely to see a massive shift very soon but perhaps as you know budgets and obviously i've seen um especially from the operators that we've been partnering with some aggressive targets regarding um you know, employing women in all levels of the organization. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to quickly reflect on that before handing Mike a pass. Well, thanks to the bouquet, first of all, Rima. Um, I mean, frankly, without more women coming through, we won't have enough talent to deliver the industry that's needed. Equally, we won't have the right balance of innovation. So we need the female talent to come through in all sorts of areas, but the pipeline is the real issue. But with regard to APIs and, and the development, I want to just say that we won't have the diversity of content unless we have more open networks to deliver more content to all those people that need it. So the idea of the App Store being the only means of delivering content is just nonsense. App Stores have a very helpful curation approach, delivery approach, but the idea of it being locked into one business model, I just don't think it was, will be sustainable. Will the GSMA API model be successful? I don't know, but I think we need to try other things. And I'm therefore welcoming the API approach because I think it will open up the developer community to new options which need to be tried. Now, clearly we're also in a platforms world, not just platforms of devices or platforms of networks, but we're in a platform world. So it may well be that the leading platforms become the most successful, whether this is the API gateway, the leading platform, I can't say at this stage, but we do need to try more options. I'd also highlight that um, the idea of licensing networks per country might change as well, because why would we necessarily multiply networks if we don't have the services range we want? Would we put some restrictions on vertical integration on some companies that might be taking too much value into the hands of one company? I suspect opening up is not just about networks or devices. It's about can the regulation be opened up to be a bit more adventurous, maybe beyond traditional national boundaries, perhaps allowing for scale and cost reduction and coverage in different ways, maybe going beyond technology boundaries such as cellular satellite, for example. There are going to be tensions later on this year on something as dull as spectrum, which some can get excited about. I can, but not everybody can. But World Radio Conference this year is looking at, well, what are the spectrum boundaries? And, and we need to see what that does to choices on the network front as well as on the coverage front and the technology choices and so on. Choices is where we need to head. Thank you. Thank you. We would like to take one final question from the online audience, and my colleague over there is going to read it for us. Thank you. Yes, there's just one question from uh, um, the online audience here. Um, it, uh, it's actually two questions. Uh, the first is to Mike. Can you describe shortly, if you will, please, Mike, um, a bit more about Open RAN and new ways of delivering business? And then the second question, which you may be able to answer at the same time, is also how does that impact cyber and security of national infrastructure? So again, if we can be quite short in in answering those two questions, that would be that would be really helpful. Thanks for leaving that to just before drinks. Uh, so Open RAN is about a standard to open up the radio access network, and clearly as you do that, that starts to mean you can address different markets in different ways. However, I think the primary driver is cost reduction, cost reduction of networks that allows you to serve more coverage in new places. It doesn't mean that it has to be one operator per one Open RAN, it could be a shared Open RAN for cities or for uh, special uh, railway stations. It could have high capacity as well. So it could have some benefits beyond just the cost reduction, new business models in particular. Uh, with regard to security, we haven't really covered that in tonight's discussion, but there certainly was a lot of uh, security type solutions at Mobile World Congress. Uh, and that is not just about minimizing fraud on networks. It was also about minimizing cyber attacks. It's also making sure that uh, networks are more ruggedized for the future. If we take examples like the initiative called Quantum Safe, there was even a, a private seminar I took part in looking at how do we make uh, networks not just resilient, but quantum safe in the event of things like RSA cracking and so on. Uh, again, I'm happy to take questions offline if you want, if you want more on that. 
the reality is that unless these networks are trusted with the security that we need on them, we're not going to use them. So we have to have security and resilience at the heart of everything we do. I'm sorry if it's a bit dull for some people, but it is it's, it's important. If you think about content delivery, we need to make sure content only gets into the people who deserve it and are willing to pay for it. Um, some other services are in a similar mode. There you go. Thank you. We won't respond to those, but I was just actually reflecting on some of my notes. So one of the topics that was quite a hot topic at the event was um, essentially around the investment gap. So in Europe, it's referred to as fair shares. So the idea being that all those who benefit from the digital economy should be investing uh, in the infrastructure to obviously maintain and uphold. Um, and so obviously mobile operators have been carrying this cost for some time. The idea yeah, now is that that's shared by uh, some of the big five OTTs and others who are contributing to uh, the bulk share of the traffic and the data traffic. So it was a very interesting uh, debate that was carried over several sessions and a strong topic in the ministerial program and perhaps one that you guys can reflect on as well uh, in your discussions over drinks. But yeah, it definitely was one of the, the big buzz topics at MWC this year. And uh, to come back on, on open run and security, I mean, obviously one of the, from, from the government's perspective, one of the main points about open run um, is to create a really resilient and, and, and more secure network. If you have a duopoly where essentially once you exclude Huawei, we've got essentially Nokia and Ericsson, um, you expose yourself um, to an attack on their technology. Well, if you have, if you disaggregate the supply chain um, safely, um, you're going to have less chance of attack. And I, as I was coming in here, actually, um, I saw downstairs this culture of little dog that that's doing this for its head. Um, the, 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 there is a reason for this is um, uh, one person explained this to me, which I thought was really good, and about the danger of um, having a, a, a not secured um, uh, run network. Um, just text us something as a smart washing machine. Would you want a smart machine, a washing machine and could they be dangerous? Um, yes, they could. So imagine that a lot of people are, are smart washing machine and suddenly, um, and, and suddenly there is a, a cyber attack and people decide to switch on all the washing machine at the same time. Um, it could literally- Chaos. <laughs> chaos, yes. Um, it could literally just cripple the power grid um, and um, create problems with water supply. So something as um, as innocuous as a smart washing machine um, could, uh, if the if the system is not safe, um, could be very dangerous uh, if there is a cyber attack. So that was my example. And on the on washing machines and hopefully clean clothes, but more than that, now we are going to move to the is the end of this event for the audience online. And I would like to thank you for watching. A big thank you to our speakers today. You shared their insights from uh, the Mobile World Congress. For you in the room, now there is some networking and also the opportunity to visit our Sony lab facility. And we go in the room here, Dr. Rita Kaleshi, uh, Director of IG Technology, will also accompany you in the journey. So big thank you to Audrey, Sue, and the WIC group for making this event possible tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much.